Hello everyone and welcome to a new video. As I've started thinking about further historical adjacent projects I want to make, I reached my typical roadblock. Patterning. <laughs> if you're new here, I actually hate patterning. <laughs> I just find flat drafting so incredibly boring, time consuming, and my brain doesn't work well with numbers in general. Just for my whole life. <laughs> Unfortunately for historical summing, drafting is the best way to ensure historical styles, as there are loads of books and magazines that teach you how to draft clothing for every period, from the period. These are often freely available online, and so they may be tempting if you're starting out sewing historically inspired clothes. I was tempted, I tried. <laughs> However, they're also freaking intimidating, and often they rely on incomplete instructions or implied knowledge. That is, the writing assumes a level of knowledge from their intended reader which was only accurate to the time period in which it was published. And that's really hard to manage for someone who's new to sewing or just started historical sewing. There are a couple of other options, such as draping, where you place fabric on a dress form and shape it into a pattern in a more intuitive and 3D way, or you can purchase a historically inspired pattern from a company. However, you may not have a dress form, you may not like draping, and sometimes there's a limited budget or the post would be too slow and you just can't get your hands on a pattern. So, <laughs> this video is for you. If you don't want a flat draft, or you want a free pattern that could be turned into something historical, I've scoured the internet, and here are some of my favorites. Please keep in mind, some of these are modern patterns that I think could be turned into something historical, uh, and I'll give you some tips on how to do that from what I understand. Uh, the others are just free historical uh, patterns that are online, but they may be untested and may be a bit finicky. The first resource I want to talk about is the Mood Society blog, so society, it's a great pun, I love it, which regularly shares free patterns with some instructions on how to assemble them. Instructions can be scarce, but they are there. I have used two patterns from there and I was fairly happy with both. I got good results, uh, so I would recommend them from what I've seen. First up, we'll open with a great one, the Bridgerton dress. As Bridgerton mania spread like wildfire across the internet, I was so impressed and Mood was able to supply a free pattern for this. Uh, this pattern is made up very similarly to the dresses from the show, where it has an overlayer and a lighter fabric. They've used a really nice sort of embroidered mesh. Um, it consists of a very high waist, just at the underbust, and a gathered skirt. The pattern also gives you adorable puff sleeves. You could make it up with the puff sleeves for an evening dress, or swap them out for a plain sleeve for the more common they wear. There's lots of possibilities here. I absolutely think this can be turned into a Regency dress very easily. You could keep the pattern as it is if you're looking for a more of a Regency costume, like in the show. However, if you wanted to try and get it a little closer to what Regency dresses were actually like, here are some tips. Number one, I would not sew the bust darts in the bodice. If you look at extant garments and patterns taken from them, Regency bodices aren't really fitted with bust darts. Some jackets are fitted with vertical darts that go up from the waist, and most that I can see simply play around with gathering. So what you could do instead is not sew the bust darts and add a little to the waist so that you could gently gather the front to fit, and that should still give you a Regency look. I just wanted to show you there are a couple of patterns, not a lot, in this book, which is Patterns of Fashion 1. This is the second edition, but I believe the, these patterns are also in the first edition if you've got that one. Um, there are a couple turn of the century patterns here that show you a little bit of what I mean. So, this one, you can see here on the bodice pattern that it, there's no darts. No darts, they just gather to fit. And I'm not sure how much of the book I can actually share with you. But that's sort of the, the rule in these examples and some of the pictures I've shown you. That's the bottom bodice pattern there. It's also just gathering. So, I mean, they don't really have a very fitted bust to start with. So you can get away with just some loose gathering and things like that. The back is also a dead giveaway of modern construction. Uh, in the patterns that I just showed you, if you look at Regency bodices, they are shaped almost like a Y with very narrow panels at the center back and the shoulder seam is moved towards the back. So the shoulder isn't right on our shoulder like modern clothing. It's usually a few centimeters towards the back. These alterations are a bit more complex, so what you could do is keep the fitted back in an underlayer, but gather the overlayer to obscure the seams a bit and conceal the modern construction a little more. Obviously this isn't like a historical accurate thing, but if, if that's what you want to do, that would be way easier as well. 
The other thing I would mention is that often Regency dresses had a plain front, that is most of the skirt gathering was at the back. So you could move some of the volume to the back so you have a plain front. So the pattern calls you to gather at the front, but if you just move some of that volume towards the back, you'll just get denser gathers at the back. And finally, I would for sure make this full length and keep the mesh over layer. Light fabrics were very popular in Regency times, and you can see in these dresses that they have quite similar fabric styles in terms of a plain underlayer and a lightweight overlayer. You can play with this to make them like different colors so that there's contrast and layers. It can be really beautiful. But I do think some of these alterations could be easily be done. And sometimes the point is just that you have a starting point. Pattern number two. Now you may have to close your eyes and squint a little bit, <laughs> but I can see an Edwardian blouse out of this pattern, the yarrow dress. If you note the high collar and the gathering at the center front, we're already halfway there. I think Edwardian shirts have been very popular because they're relatively easy to make and they can work with so many different looks. These were called waists at the time or shirt waists and they had many different styles. They could look more like a traditional man's shirt and close at the front or they could boast more fabric and detail and close at the center back. You can trim these out, you can add lace, you can add fabric plackets, you can add dimension. They're a really good blank canvas. These photographs by Edward Lindley Samburn and shared by the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea Library Time Machine blog, which I'll link down below, show some of the possibilities. This one from the 30th of June, 1908, shows the high collar and extra fabric at the centre front. And this one from 1906 shows the centre front closure. A couple of things to note. <laughs> Often Edwardian shirtwaists had an extra swoop at the hem at the front, which helps create that droopiness that we often call the pigeon breast look. This book is called The Voice of Fashion, and it has drafting instructions is a bit of a loose term, but it has diagrams on how to draft historically accurate patterns, because these are all from magazine, a magazine that was published at the time. So for example, this pattern is for a shirtwaist from May 1906. This is the sketch of it right there. And then I can show you what I mean by the little swoop. It's this. So this is the center front and you can see that it kind of swoops down here. So that's what I would recommend adding. The Yara dress pattern has darts at the waist, which I simply wouldn't sew. I'd recommend you add this swoop simply by extending the center front downwards and then curving it with a French curve or by eye. I would also add some volume to the sleeves, as Edwardian sleeves aren't quite as slim as the one on the arrow pattern. You could swap it out for the sleeves on this other dress, the birch dress, I'll link, I'll link all of these down below, and just adapt it. The third pattern, now, please keep in mind that I am not a 20th century person at all, well, up to like 1910, a very small percentage of the 20th century. But I saw this pattern, the snapdragon skirt, and I thought it would work really well for a 1930s or 1940s skirt. In the 1930s, the skirts changed to be longer again, and the waist rose back to its natural place, a big difference from the 1920s look. The 1930s was characterized by simple, long and slender lines from top to ankle with slightly flaring skirts at the bottom. This seems to be a really nice versatile pattern. They've made it up in a heavier fabric, a wool suiting, but it can, I can see it working in a lighter weight fabric too, which would make a drapier skirt. If you're intimidated by the godets, they've included a little tutorial in the blog post about them, or you could just move them to the side seams where they're much easier to insert, but keep in mind that will change the shape of the skirt. I'd say be a little careful with how much volume there seems to be at the hem of this pattern. For a slender look, you could try making without the godets, which give it extra flair. This will also make the pattern much easier to sew. <laughs> Alternatively, you could add extra flair to the godets or side seams and shorten it to take it into the 1940s too. This would make a great staple item in your wardrobe, look really cute with a blouse. The blouse they've paired it with, I think I need to investigate because it's also super cute. Now we're going to move away from mood because I feel like this whole video could be patterns for mood, but we needed a little bit of variety. So did you know that there are free corset patterns online? I wish I'd known this earlier. How have I only come up to this now? This pattern looks beautiful. Uh, this pattern appears in at least two original period magazines, uh, De Gracieuse and La Mode Illustrée from 1906. It was digitized and sized by Arinia Black. I hope I'm saying that right. And it's perfect for an Edwardian mid bust look. I have a corset with a very similar shape, I'll insert a photo, and it's one of my absolute favorites. Edwardian corsets were essential to create the fashionable S silhouette, which had become popular around the turn of the century. 
This type of corset was often called the health corset, and it came about as the epitome of concerns regarding corsets and their impact on the body. This was a popular debate in media at the time, which hinged on the small percentage of the population that practiced tight lacing. Advertisements took advantage of this consumer-based anxiety and started advertising a new healthy model of corsets, which had longer lines and pushed the bust forward and the hips backwards, creating what we now call the S-shape. This was an attempt to move the shaping or pressure away from the waist and the abdomen, which was believed to be impairing to your health. Combined with padding, this created a very dramatic silhouette. Keep in mind that sewing corsets, particularly Edwardian corsets with complex shapes, is more advanced sewing. I'd also say that wearing padding with these shapes is really important. My corset has inbuilt hip padding and the silhouette is greatly improved whenever I wear it with a bust improver. I've actually got a video about Edwardian bust improvers where I've made one um, and it includes a free pattern. So I'll link that down below as well. It's a really quick and easy project that you can do and it, it will help your silhouette a lot. Although I haven't tried out this pattern myself, I have heard great things about Arena Black and their amazing wealth of knowledge. Please keep in mind that doesn't, this doesn't include any sewing instructions. <laughs> That's why I said advanced. Um, however, I have made an Edwardian corset before using period appropriate methods. So you could use the same construction I shared in that video to apply to this pattern. I'll link it down below as well. Pattern number five. This is a bit of an unknown, <laughs> as again, I haven't tried this pattern myself, but it looks so cute. This pattern is for an 1848 jacket and it was digitized and made freely available by Hannah of Marmotta's Dress Diaries. I believe this is technically based on an extant jacket that is Czech national costume of 1848, but I think it can also be adapted into a more general mid-Victorian long jacket. Hannah also has a wonderful post about the history behind this type of dress, which I'll link below. And the original pattern from the actual extant is also included if you wanted to try it from scratch. Victorian jackets came in all shapes and sizes. Towards the mid of the century, it was often fashionable to have them skirted and long so that the hem of the jacket draped over the widening skirts. They were often fitted at the waist with darts, which is very typical of Victorian construction and continues throughout the rest of the century. Victorian construction actually really doesn't change that much throughout the century. Darts are your best friend. This particular pattern is super interesting because you can see that the top of the arm side is quite far down the shoulder to create those 1840 sloping shoulders. A few warnings, Hannah herself has warned that this is an untested free pattern with no seam allowances and no notches. So this would definitely require a mock-up. However, once you've put it together as a mock-up, you can add notches to the pattern to make it easier to sew up the second time. The other thing you can do after printing and prepping the pattern is to measure the seams and make sure they correspond before you cut the mock-up, which will save you a step further down the line. There are a few things you could do to it. You could move the shoulders a little further up and it'll take you out of the 1840s and further into the second half of the 19th century. Depending on the fabric and trimmings, this could be really versatile. You could turn it into an 1880s dressing jacket like these two. I'm very tempted to try this one myself, so let me know if you have tried something similar. I'm actually working on a coat at the moment, but it's more of an Edwardian look, and I drape the pattern, and the pattern when it's flat looks very similar to this. So I definitely think it's got really good potential. And I think that is it for today. This was so much fun. Um, this is by no means a comprehensive survey of the free patterns out there, but I wanted to give you some options in case you're starting to sew, but things like the Keystone Guide to Jacket and Dressmaking from the 1890s is too intimidating. Uh, or if you're already sewing, some inspiration for some new projects. I've I, Like I've done it, I've done the archive.org free 1890s book, trying to draft where half the instructions don't match up and then you're just pulling your hair out and you just have to make it up and then it feels wrong. Sometimes all you need with patterns is a starting point, something already down on paper that you can then shape and alter into what you need rather than starting at a blank page for a few hours. And then once you've built up a little bit of a backlog, you can just adapt patterns that you already have. There is so much content out there if you're in a pinch and you can't order a pattern. Let me know in the comments if you like this type of video and I may do some more because there's more out there. <laughs> if this is your type of content, please consider subscribing. I do sewing videos all the time, maybe too often. Thank you for watching and I'll see you all soon.